the claims of Christ. We're looking Sunday by Sunday, we're working our way to Easter Sunday. The claims of Christ. He made some amazing claims, some outlandish, outrageous claims. And uh, Jesus is either who he said he was or he's the greatest liar who ever walked the face of the earth, the greatest deceiver who ever walked the face of the earth. Because we saw last week he claimed pre-existence. And then he claimed a supernatural birth. And then he claimed sinlessness. Can you imagine that? If I stood up here and said, I've never sinned, <laughs> you'd laugh real hard, and you should. <laughs> but Jesus claimed sinlessness. He was born without a sin nature. He lived a sinless night, life, perfect life. He went to the cross. He who knew no sin became sin for us. He became sin for me, for you. He took my sin. He took your sin on the cross so that when we receive him, the righteousness of God could be ours. And what a story. What an amazing grace of God. And so we saw his preexistence, his supernatural birth, his sinlessness. Now, Jesus' greatest claim was this. I will come back from the grave on the third day. We will see that on Easter Sunday. But today, I want you to see one of his claims. Jesus claimed omnipotence. Omnipotence. Jesus claimed omnipotence. Omni means all. Potent means power. Jesus claimed all power. He said, I have all power. He claimed it by assertion, and he claimed it by demonstration. He claimed it with his words. He claimed it with his deeds. We see it in Matthew in 28 where he said, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Wow, what a claim. And then he showed it by his deeds. And he mentioned this in John chapter 10. If I do not the works of my father, do not believe in me. And he goes on talking about it in the next verses about how his works are supernatural and powerful. And of course, we could be here a long time talking about his miraculous deeds, about, about his miracles. But time will not allow us to talk about all that today. I want to just talk about one, one miracle that Jesus did. It's in Luke chapter 5. And I'm going to read you the little story. It's one of my favorites in all the Bible, and it's going to be on the screen, or you can turn to it, Luke chapter 5. It is such an amazing story, and I'm going to read it to you, beginning in Luke 5, 1. Here it is. Now it happened that while the crowd was pressing around him and listening to the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, or it's also called Sea of Galilee. And he saw two boats lying at the edge of the lake. But the fishermen had gotten out of them and were washing their nets. You see, they had fished all night. And they were washing their nets, preparing to go home and crash. They needed some rest. They had fished all night long. And it's morning, and Jesus says, uh, well, first of all, he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, whom we know as Peter. Jesus changed his name to Peter later and asked him to put out a little way from the land. And he sat down and began teaching the people from the boat. Jesus used Peter's boat for a platform because the crowds were pressing upon him. And so he said, Peter, let me use your boat. And he got in his boat and he thrust out just a little way. And it, I've been over there. It's beautiful. And, 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 the, and the mountains kind of come down towards the lake. And so it was a natural uh, amphitheater with the crowd out here and the, uh, going up and, and Jesus in the boat being able to, to speak to them. And when he sat down, he began teaching the people. And when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Now this is an, a, a weird request by Jesus. And I'll tell you why it was weird. Because in the in the Sea of Galilee, you only fished at night. 
because in the heat of the day, the fish would go down deep where it was cool and they weren't feeding. And you, couldn't, you could cast your net all day long, catch no fish because the fish are not up, they're down. And so the fishermen were, uh, they worked nights, they were on the night shift <laughs> and they had just fished all night. And now it's morning. In fact, Jesus has been teaching. It's probably getting towards midday. And Jesus says, let's, cut, let's launch out and cast your nets again. And Peter looks at him like, you got to be kidding me. <laughs> Look at what Peter says. Simon Peter answered and said, Master, we worked hard all night and caught nothing. I don't know about you, but that's the way it is when I go fishing, John. John's a master angler back there, and I just want you to know, when I go fishing, I catch nothing. <laughs> I, I, I like my fishing joke, John. It, a fish, my fishing joke is this. Uh, to me, a fisherman is a, a jerk at one end of the line waiting for a jerk at the other end of the line. <laughs> Got you, buddy. But anyway, uh, we fished all night. We caught nothing. And, and, and that's the situation. Peter's tired. He worked all night long. And now they've, they've washed their nets. You can see they've rolled them up, folded them up, whatever. They're ready to go home and crash. And the Lord says, Let's launch back out into the deep for a catch. <laughs> and Peter's thinking, listen, I'm a professional fisherman. You may be a fine rabbi and a fine teacher and maybe a carpenter, but you don't know anything about fishing. Master, we worked hard all night, caught nothing. But then there's this little conjunction. But I will do as you say, and let down the nets. I'm so glad he said that, aren't you? <laughs> I will do as you say, and let down the nets. And when they had done this, listen to this, they enclosed a great quantity of fish, and their nets began to break. I mean, it is beyond capacity. so that they signaled to their partners in the other boat for them to come and help them. And they came and they filled both the boats so that they began to sink. Wow. <gasps> Does this blow you away? I mean, they fished all night, didn't catch a thing. Drew up an empty net again and again and again. And now the nets are breaking. And now they're calling their partners. <laughs> and they've got so many fish, the boats are starting to sink. Peter's never seen anything like this before. All the fish in the Sea of Galilee are coming to get in their nets. <laughs> and Peter is, he's blown away. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell at Jesus' feet. Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. Whenever anyone feels the presence of God, they also feel their sin. You know that? I am a sinful man. For amazement had seized him and all his companions because of the catch of fish which they had taken. So also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. Amazement had seized them. They are astounded. They'd fished all their life. Never, never seen anything close to this. He realizes, I'm in the presence of omnipotence. I'm in the presence of power. This is no natural man. Something's up here. Peter, depart from me. I'm a sinner. And Jesus said to Simon, do not fear. From now on, you will be catching people. 
You'll be catching men, mankind, people. You will be catching people, Peter. This is a call. This is God speaking to Peter about something far greater. And when they had their, brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. Wow. I just love that. I just love that story. They left it all. They left the boats. They left the nets. They left their profession. And I'm sure they thought, I don't know what we're getting into. What's this catching people? <laughs> I don't know what we're, I don't know what the call's all about, but he called us. And, 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 and whatever it is, we're into it because of who he is. We want to be a part of it because of who he is. This is the omnipotence of Jesus Christ. Not just all power is given to me. He didn't just say it, he showed it. Time and time and time and time again with his miracles. This is the call of Peter and James and John. They really didn't know him before this. I want us to have some application today. I don't want us just to get information. I want application. I have three applications. If, if our God is omnipotent, what's it mean to us? What, what about our cause? What about, here it is. There's three things that I want us to have as a church, as a people. Number one, I want us to have a relentless pursuit of people. And I mean a relentless pursuit, one that will not stop. I mean a passion for people. This is what Jesus said to Peter, you will catch people. When you catch fish of the sea, they die. <laughs> when you catch people, they come alive. You will catch people. Our church was founded on a passion to reach people for Jesus Christ. This is what it's really all about. This year, every Sunday, I've been sharing with you four things, our vision for you. Number one, know God. Know God. I want you to know God. If you haven't come to know him yet, that's my passion. I want to help you to come to know God. If you know him, I want to stir your heart to say like the Apostle Paul, that I might know him that I might really be close, that I might really know him. It's not about a religion. It's not about rules and regulation. It's about a relationship, knowing God, an exciting relationship. God is your heavenly father, God who loves you, you who love God. In a love relationship with God, this is the key to living. The key to living is knowing God. The key to living is a relationship between you and God. There's nothing more important than your relationship to God. A relentless pursuit of people. Jesus said, you shall catch people. Jesus was all about people, you know that? That's what his passion was. His message, message never changes. The methods change. Oh my, do they ever change. They have changed a lot in just the 47 years since I've been pastor. You know? The methods change, but the message is the same. Today we preach the same message of Christ who went to the cross, came forth from the grave, bore our sins and is alive to, and, and can forgive us and come into our lives. The same message we preached 40 plus years ago. The message does not change. The methods might, yes, but never the message. Jesus gave us his mission in Luke 19. He said, I came to seek and to save the lost. That's his mission, his mission, his message, and it's our mission. A relentless pursuit of people. That's what God wants us to have. That's what our church must be all about because heaven and hell are at stake 
Eternal destiny is at stake for people. And so Jesus knew that. And so Jesus called Peter and James and John to leave the nets and the boat and come and follow me. And God calls us to a relentless pursuit of people. And you know, in, in, in talking about our relentless pursuit of people, I really want to emphasize a radical commitment to children and youth. I believe with all my heart, as we reach people, God wants us to reach the next generation. God wants us to reach the children, the youth. This is why, Pastor Carl, listen to this, listen to this. 93% of the people who receive Christ do so before age 18. Is that astounding to you? It is to me. 93% of the people who receive Christ do so before age 18. I mean, I was nine years old when I started getting into the Bible and I gave my commitment to Jesus Christ. A couple Sundays ago when we baptized up here, you can't see it, but the baptistry's up here. And uh, Shane, Pastor Shane was in our baptistry baptizing and he made mention, he said, I was 10 years old, I was baptized in the same baptistry. It wasn't in this building, but it was in another building. We've moved this baptistry three times. But he, in that fiberglass tank, he said, I was baptized by Pastor Carl when I was 10 years old. Last Sunday, Maxine Drevo caught me in the lobby and she said, uh, this week it'll be 43 years. 43 years ago, Don and I received Christ as our personal savior. And, uh, and so she was a little past 18 because she's 90 now. But, <laughs> and so we're gonna reach people of all ages, but I want you to know, Jesus had a passion for children. They said to the kids, hey, you get back, he's busy. He said, oh no, oh no, let the children come. He had a passion for kids. He loved the children. Do you know there's a generation in our America today that is the largest generation we have ever known. We call them the millennials. They were born between 1980 and 2000. There are 78 million millennials in America today. <laughs> Only less than one out of five goes to church. Why? Because they hate Jesus and hate the gospel and hate the church. No. No, that's not it at all. In fact, research tells us that they are more open to the gospel today than ever before. Many of them are having children now, and they're saying, well, wait a minute, what are we doing? And, uh, and, th and they're more open. And so we have a golden opportunity, absolute golden opportunity to reach a younger generation for Jesus Christ. I, I honestly have dreams of building a, a children's facility that just knock your socks off someday. Whether I'm here or not, but you may build it. But uh, it'll be glass, and it'll, it'll, it'll make Champions Fun Center look like a boring place. I mean, it'll have so much fun. Uh, so many, and, and when, when, when a kid rides by in a car, he or she will say, Mama, can we go there? <laughs> and then when they... When they come on their way home, Mama, can we go back? Because it's the funnest place on the face of the earth in Lincoln, Nebraska. And, 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 and they hear about Jesus who loves them. When we started our church, one thing I remember discussing with my wife, my passion, I said, is to give kids what I had when I was growing up. I had a Christian mom and dad, a Christian home, and uh, my dad didn't know what it was. I don't ever remember missing church for sickness. I mean, if you were sick, it was, oh, forget it. Get in the car, we're going. <laughs> my dad, my dad didn't, he didn't know what sick was, you know. I've been here 47 years. I've never missed a Sunday for sickness. I never have. 
Better knock on some wood, I get. But uh, <clears throat> you'd have to really educate my dad if he were here today, you know, about this thing that's going on. Because, <laughs> because my dad always said, "Crawl in sick, don't call in sick," you know. <laughs> I have to tell you this. Yesterday, I'm at a ball game over at Northeast High School for our team, and I had a guy look me up. He came over and said, "You're." You're Pastor Carl, aren't you? You're Pastor Godman? He said, yeah, yeah. He said, I was hoping you'd come because I knew your team. And I said, well, I'm coming, man. My team's here. And, and he said, I have to tell you this. He said, I was in Sunday school in your church. I mean, this was a man, not, not a young man. But he said, when I was 10 years old. And I talked to him and he told me where he and his family go to church now, good church, and I was glad to hear that. He said, but I was in your dad's class when I was 10 years old. And he started just reeling off stories about my dad. <laughs> oh, my. He said, your dad wanted us to learn the books of the Bible. We had a little song. <laughs> he said, I can still sing it to this day. <laughs> Ten years old. And I walked away thinking, you know, the ripples of my dad still flowing, still going out. He's in heaven. But, you know, I, what should we have? You shall catch people. The omnipotent Savior said to Peter, a fisherman, you shall catch people. And, and, and we need that passion for people that Jesus had. The second thing we need is this, is a voice. But the second thing we need... <laughs> The second thing we need is a fanatical commitment to transforming lives. I don't want to just bring people to Jesus for forgiveness, but I want to take them also to transformation. In the first chapters of the book of Romans, Paul describes justification. He describes how you can have a relationship with God, and he talks about he talks about the death of Jesus, the burial, the resurrection, and how, how a sinner can come to know God through Jesus. And that's in the first chapters of Roman, and then, uh, Romans. And then in chapter 12, he says, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed. He's talking to believers. The temptation for me, the temptation for you, is to be fitted into the mold of this world. Think like the world, live like the world. But no, no. What people need is a commitment to transforming lives, a transformation. And this is the second of our four things that I've been sharing, our vision for you. One is no God. The second is find freedom. Finding freedom. Jesus said the truth will make you free. We want to be free. You see, when we come to God, we, we come a lot of times with a, a lot of baggage and bondage, and we, and, and, and we are addicted to maybe drugs or alcohol or, or, or greed or, or anger or bitterness or, uh, or lust and pornography, or we're, and, and, and we need freedom. We need freedom. I remember one year in Bible school, we had a little boy, we brought up a little boy, and we had him put his arms like this, and we wrapped a string around him, tied it once, and we said, okay, see if you can break free. Boop, he popped that string. <laughs> and then we took the same little boy with his arms down like this, and we wrapped a string around him, not once, but again and again and again and again and again, many times. And then we said, okay, see if you can break free. He couldn't do it. Proverbs chapter five talks about the cords of sin, how it wraps around us and how sin gets a hold of us, and, and we need to find freedom. And Jesus said, you can know the truth, and the truth will make you free. And so a relentless pursuit of people. Secondly, a fanatical commitment to transforming lives, transforming people's lives. A third thing, and lastly, a passion to produce and equip and send out leaders. I believe Jesus is the hope of the world and I believe the church is the hope of the world because the church is the vehicle that Jesus founded for the, for the gospel to get out to the world. 
And so the church needs leaders. Everything rises and falls on leadership. Some might be pastors, but many leaders in the church, as we have here, that God has raised up great leaders. And we are blessed with that. And, and, and so uh, my passion is, is that we could raise champions, raise up champions for Christ. I mean graduating from high schools, from North Star, from Lincoln High, from Northeast, from Southwest, whatever. And of course, from Parkview, of kids that will, that will be champions for Christ. Kids that will be Christians, but yes, even more. Jesus never said go into the world and make Christians. He said go into the world and make disciples, followers, people who leave the nets and the boats and really follow. Follow Jesus Christ. And some college people from our Christ on the Couch Ministries. Can you imagine if every year we had a dozen or so that would just committed and several dozen from the high schools and, and just committed to Jesus Christ, fanatically following Jesus Christ and, and, and excited about being equipped to lead and make a difference in their lives. And that brings me to our third thing. First, know God. Secondly, find freedom. And thirdly, discover your purpose. Discover your purpose. We took a Sunday on this a couple Sundays ago. Do you know we had over 150 people go out to our ministry fair and fill out a card and be a part of the cause of Christ here at Calvary? People finding a purpose. We are called according to his purpose, the Bible says. You shall catch people. You shall catch people. I went into our vision team a few weeks ago, whenever it was, I can't remember, and, and uh, in our Parkview vision team, and I said, I'm not seeing enough life change. And boy, we just, we just kicked that ball around for the longest time and talked about it. We have a great vision team. And we, we came up with, with groups. And we, have, we call them tea group, tea groups, transform groups. And I have four boys, and all of our men have boys, and and our gals have the girls, and, and we meet every other week. We have chapel one week, on the other week we meet in our tea groups, and four boys. And I call those boys' names in prayer day after day. And, 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 and I'm seeing, I am seeing already dramatic, dramatic change in the lives of kids. Already. It's just absolutely astounding, amazing what God is doing. And this is our passion, to, to see people come to know him, to be transformed, and then to make a difference. To make a difference and to say, I will follow him. I will follow him. Jesus said, you shall catch people. You shall catch people. And I'm sure Peter thought, what is that? What's that all about? And I love what Jesus said. Do not fear. <laughs> you shall catch people. I need the do not fear part. <laughs> Say, are you afraid? I've been afraid since I was 16 years old and God called me. <laughs> you know, morning after morning, I say to myself, Psalm 34, 4, I sought the Lord and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. If you're not afraid, you're probably not living by faith. <laughs> There's a little tinge of fear when God calls you. And uh, I think Peter had that. Do not fear, Jesus said. Why? I'm the omnipotent God. If I can order the fish of the sea, I can help you to catch people. I can do the miraculous in people's lives. That's the kind of God we serve. He can do the miraculous. Well, Pastor Carl, you don't know how I fail. God probably never used me. Listen, Peter was a custom fisherman. <laughs> I mean, the night when Jesus needed him more than ever, Peter swore and said, I don't know the man. But our Lord later came to him and said, Peter, do you love me? I do. I love you, Lord. Get back in the ministry. Get back fishing for men. Get back fishing for Peter, for people. 
And I want you to know, do not fear. We serve an omnipotent God. And God will do great things. If we have a relentless pursuit of people, if we are fanatically committed to people being transformed, if we want to develop and equip leaders for the future, I believe God will do some things in your lifetime, in my lifetime, that will be amazing. Did he use Peter? (laughs) Well, in Acts chapter 1, Jesus went to heaven in his glorified body. In Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit came to live within people. And Peter stood up and he preached the first sermon of the church. And he said, Jesus Christ died on the cross. He was buried and he rose again. And you can know Jesus and you can have forgiveness of sin. And look at how he closed his sermon. Here's how he closed it. Repent each of you and be baptized in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins. And look at how they responded. Those who received his word were baptized. And that day they were added about three thousand souls <laughs> Peter follow me and you will be fishers of people did it happen yes it did yes it did it happened and that's our make an impact I want you to know Peter made an impact just a fisherman and God used him God used him and God can use you And God can use me in a needy world today. We can know God. We can find freedom. We can discover our purpose. And we can make an impact. We thank you, Heavenly Father. We thank you that even in a difficult world today that we live in, you are working and we know you're working. We see your hand. Thank you, dear God. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. I invite you to join me in this prayer. In your heart where you sit, would you talk to God? What is he talking to you about today? Do you know him? If you don't, you can, I want you to know that. Is he talking to you about finding freedom, discovering your purpose? making an impact what is he calling you to would you talk to god would you listen for his voice today as he speaks to you thank you heavenly father thank you for the many wonderful blessings you have poured out upon us you are a great god and we love you you are omnipotent and therefore we need not fear Our hope and our trust is in you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.